Well, I mean, that wouldn't be a shout your abortion moment for sure. You wouldn't go around being proud of the fact that you exercise your bodily autonomy and you basically caused a car accident that caused your child to be on death's doorstep and they said, well, we can save them with a blood transfusion from you and you refused. You'd think of that person as being scum of the earth and you'd be right. And so once you change the parameters to make it a little bit more similar to a actual abortion scenario, all of a sudden that hypothetical doesn't look nearly as appealing, does it? Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Here's another one, and I actually think that this is one of the better abortion arguments. Now, none of them are particularly good, but this one actually is one of the better ones. It's, it's known as the violinist hypothetical. So this is a thought process, a, a thought exercise, if you will, in whether or not abortion and, and outlawing abortion is good. So essentially, this is the way that the argument goes. It tries to take the question of whether or not the baby inside is a life or not off of the table. So it will, if someone uses this on you, normally what they will do is they will acknowledge that the baby growing inside the womb is indeed a human and is indeed a life, but they'll say that doesn't matter and here's why. They make a very libertarian argument on this and I'll explain why that's actually not a libertarian argument, but we'll, we'll go on with this uh, line of thinking just to illustrate it. So the, the way that the hypothetical is posited is usually something along these lines. They'll say, let's say that there was this very cherished violinist in this community that everybody liked and everybody admired. And because of it, the community really had a stake in keeping the violinist alive because they really cherished the art and the enrichment that that person brought to the community. Well, one night the violinist is in a terrible car accident and there's only one person in the town that has the blood type that that person needs to survive. Should you be able to, without the person's consent, find them and strap them down to a blood transfusion chair and take their blood out of them to give to the violinist because everybody in the town believes that that would be the best thing to do. Now, the obvious answer to that, which I actually agree with the pro-abortion crowd on, is no, you shouldn't be able to just take somebody's blood, whether you think that it's important for them to or not. Now, most people, even on the pro-abortion side, would acknowledge that is the moral thing to do. If you know for a fact that there is somebody that is going to die if they do not receive a blood transfusion from you, the moral thing to do would be to offer up that blood transfusion. And so it's interesting that most of the pro-abortion crowd will actually say abortion is good, but if they posit this hypothetical, they will acknowledge that it would be a good thing to do that, but they shouldn't be required to do that. And so there's a little bit of a mixing there. They'll say abortion is a moral good. Denying the person the blood transfusion would be a moral evil even though they're trying to equate the two things. But on the legal perspective, I actually understand where they're coming from. And this is why this is one of the very few abortion arguments that I actually respect, because it is at least honest. It admits that the baby in the womb is indeed a human life. And if you're saying that, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with the analysis in that particular scenario, and I actually don't have a problem with thought exercises. I like them. I think they're actually kind of fun. And I think that it can show some of the flaws in your argument. So saying all that, that you may be sitting there uh, on your computer screen shocked, like, Caleb, are you saying that you agree with this argument? I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm saying that I respect it because it is at least honest. Now I'm going to explain to you why that analogy does not work in the context of abortion. Well, first of all, before I get into that, I will say that it actually does so show the superiority of the libertarian mindset because abortion is basically the one issue that almost all Democrats agree the government should have hands off. The government should not interfere or intervene in any way that they actually prefer small government in this one very specific contest. Now, that, now they prefer large intrusive government in basically every other facet of life except for this one very specific issue of abortion. And on that one issue where they actually do have a libertarian argument, they seem to always default back to that. They actually do say, okay, well, it would be better if the government didn't get involved here. Hands, you know, get the government out of my, my body, out of my medical decisions. Perfectly fine with jabbing you against your will, but they do, <laughs> which is weird. 
but they do have a uh, they do actually have a libertarian argument on that. And I think that shows the superiority of the libertarian argument, the fact that they try to default back to it whenever they can in this one scenario where it actually works in their favor. However, here's the problem with the violinist hypothetical. Morally, it's true that the person should volunteer to help. But if that's morally correct, how can you justify the shout your abortion mentality that seems to be so prominent on the left right now? For the longest time, even in my lifetime, the earlier part of my lifetime, the whole safe, legal, and rare thing was sort of the, the watchword of the day for the Democrat Party. And every time they did talk about abortion, they talked about it as a terrible, evil thing, but that needed to be made available, basically a necessary evil, just so if, if there was a bad scenario that came up, that that was a right that was protected and an option that was available to them. However, here's the problem with that scenario. The person with the rare blood type in that particular scenario they didn't do anything to put the violinist in that situation. They didn't. They were just sitting there minding their own business when the community called upon them to do something against their will. So I would like to actually adjust the scenario a little bit. What if the person that was supposed to be giving the blood transfusion was driving? And what if they were doing so recklessly and they're the one that caused the accident that led to the violinist being in the state that they're in well now all of a sudden that actually changes the scenario quite a bit doesn't it because now the person that has the rare blood type has a obligation to make rectification for them and this is something that goes all the way back to ancient law i mean we're talking about old testament law in the book of leviticus we're talking about, um, you know, the ancient Mesopotamian laws that we can read in cuneiform and, and all of those things uh, back to ancient Egyptian law. There is this idea that if you are the person that causes injury upon another person, then you're the person that is responsible for some level of restitution. So, for example, in the Bible, it is if you cause the death, even accidentally, of your neighbor's livestock, you were supposed to restore that uh, make a restitution and restore that person's livestock to them by giving them one of your own. And so that's something that from a, a legal and a moral perspective, the person with the rare blood type, if they were the person that caused the violinist to do this, they should be legally obligated to have their blood taken because they were the one that caused that situation to arise in the first place. As long as it's not going to cause any kind of like permanent injury to them or something like that, that's actually something that would be legally justified in that very specific circumstance. And let's actually add another element to this thought exercise. What if not only the violinist had put that person in that situation, but the reason that they share the same blood type and they have a, a similar genetic code is because they're actually that person's parent. Now, that might not change the legality, but I mean, what would you think about somebody that if they had the their child, the violinist, in that situation and they refused to give them a blood transfusion? Well, I mean, that wouldn't be a shout your abortion moment for sure. You wouldn't go around being proud of the fact that you exercise your bodily autonomy and you basically caused a car accident that caused your child to be on death's doorstep and they said, well, we can save them with a blood transfusion from you and you refused. You'd think of that person as being scum of the earth, and you'd be right. And so once you change the parameters to make it a little bit more similar to an actual abortion scenario, all of a sudden that hypothetical doesn't look nearly as appealing, does it? Furthermore, and this is really the big kicker, every single time, and this is why I say the adjustment of that hypothetical is important, every single time a person has sex, they are consenting to pregnancy with no exceptions. Now, I get that rape is a different thing, and, and that's a whole other discussion, and I've actually talked about that in my last video. I recommend you go back and, and watch that video, the rebuttal to the, the rape argument, if you're interested in that. So I'm not going to replow that ground again. But in this hypothetical, if you're talking about something that is going to be a one-to-one -one comparison with 98% of the cases when it comes to abortion, you would have to be, you would have to have it where the person is the one that put the violinist in peril of their own life. 
And that is exactly what a person does when they consent to have sex with someone. They're consenting to the possibility of a pregnancy every single time. And it's also the reason that if you look back on my video a year ago where I was rebutting another abortion argument, I talk about the responsibility of the man. The man should also be held legally responsible for the life that he had a hand in creating. Yes, the baby is growing inside the mother, but that's just as much his baby as it is hers. And there should be legal and financial consequences for that. Because every single time, with no exceptions, when you are having sex with someone, you are consenting to at least the possibility of a pregnancy. And if that pregnancy results, you should have to deal with the consequences of that action. Now, that may just look like carrying the baby to term and putting it up for adoption. That's perfectly okay. That may look like you uh, being on child support for the rest of your life for that child, even if you decide not to stay with the mother. I'm perfectly okay with that scenario too. And I think that's actually what should happen if she decides to raise the baby. You ought to have to financially support that woman from then on. But my point in all of that is, once you actually start to fiddle around with the hypothetical and make it more like an abortion scenario, suddenly the hypothetical doesn't look like such an ironclad argument on this. And also, there's something to consider here. A blood transfusion is also an artificial medical process. Pregnancy is a natural process. So there is a difference there as well. Blood transfusions, though they're great things and have saved probably no telling how many millions of lives, they are something that a medical personnel must do to you to save somebody's life. The opposite true is in the case of an abortion. Abortion is a medical personnel invading the body and stopping a medical or a natural process by means of medical intervention. Again, that's the difference between positive and negative liberties. That's somebody invading your body and stopping the process rather than repairing your body from some kind of injury that it has incurred. And so that also is part of the reason that it's not really a one-to-one -one comparison when it comes to this hypothetical. And this is actually the main reason that I think the whole forced birth thing is a stupid phrase. Like the idea that the government is forcing birth upon you because you had sex and got pregnant. No, that's just the natural result of your own decisions and the natural processes that occur within your body. I mean, that would be like saying, oh, well, the government is forcing me to respirate. No, you idiot, that's your lungs. That's the natural process of your life. The, the government is not forcing you to breathe air and take in nutrients from it. It's not forcing your cells to undergo respiration and convert O2 into CO2. That's not the way that this works. And so the idea that it is some kind of forced birth is dumb because, again, that's the difference between a medical intervention to solve some kind of injury and a medical intervention to stop a properly working natural process. Two completely different things. It is uh, an abortion is forcing a birth not to continue. That's why it's called a termination. But allowing your body to just undergo its natural process and give birth, that's not forcing you to do anything. That's just letting nature take its course and saying you're not allowed to inflict injury upon the baby living inside of you. So I actually propose if you come up with something like this, because I think that this is actually one of the very few abortion arguments I do have some respect for, because at least it is honest. I propose an alternate thought exercise that I think better illustrates the pro-life position. So let's say for the example... Uh, that I am somebody, and I actually have done this before because I worked on Auburn's uh, Low Ropes course, and so I have a little bit of training in this scenario, not with rock climbing specifically, but with uh, working with ropes and acting as somebody's anchor and belay. Uh, so let's say that I'm out with one of my buddies, and we're on a cliffside, and I say, okay, you can, propel, uh, you can rappel down that cliffside, and I'll stand up here, and I'll act as your anchor. And then he gets about halfway down, and I decide, you know what? I don't like the fact that he's using my body anymore. Bodily autonomy, it's my body, my choice. I can do what I want to. I'm just going to cut this cord so that he can't use my body weight anymore to support his life. Okay, that's murder. Now, if he were rappelling down the cliffside by himself and had tied himself to something else, and all of a sudden his rope comes loose, if I don't save him, that's not murder. It's immoral, but it's not murder. Because he did that of his own free will and he wasn't using my body. Once I have entered into a contract, which is what pregnancy is, again, when you have sex, you're consenting to the possibility of pregnancy. 
once I've entered into that implied contract with him that if you propel down this cliffside and use my body weight as a counterbalance to that, then I can't just cut him loose whenever I decide to. Once he's returned to safety, I can remove that weight from my body, but I'm not allowed to just decide halfway through, uh, yeah, I don't like the fact that he's using my body weight anymore. Snip. Nope, that's not the way that works. I am obligated to allow him to use my body because I already entered into that contract with him and consented to it until he is able to get safely either down or, or back up on the cliffside, and I can safely remove it without any injury to him. Again, if he had done it by himself and he falls and I don't rescue him, that's not my fault. It might be immoral for me to not rescue him, but legally I can't be held accountable for him doing that action. If I'm the one that put him in that scenario and then halfway through decided that I'm going to breach that contract and cut him loose, even though I consented to it in the first place, that makes me a murderer. And so I actually think that that is a much more fitting analogy and better hypothetical to engage in if anybody asks you about this. And the weird thing is, objectively, this is the best pro-abortion argument there is, or at least the best one that I've ever heard. This is the best that they have. And it still doesn't work. Granted, it's way better than most of the other arguments they have because all the other arguments pretty much are just distractions or trying to divert away from the fact that the baby inside of the womb is indeed alive. They either ignore that or they try to come up with some clever argument that, that you know, uh, denies that fact, even though it's, it's blatantly clear to anybody that is willing to look at it objectively. This one actually does acknowledge that, and I respect the fact that it is at least honest. But it's also trying to make the case that you should be allowed to kill somebody as long as they are, you know, using your body in any way that you deem inappropriate, even if you're the one that consented to it. And that's the part that it leaves out is that you're the one that put them in that position in the first place. And you're not allowed to just cut them loose after you've already consented to them being there. And so that's the part where I think this hypothetical really fails, but it is the best argument that they have. And even that one doesn't stand up to scrutiny. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call. TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. 